and welcome. I'm Kim Hosen. I'm the Executive Director of Prince William Conservation Alliance, and I am so glad you could join us tonight. Prince William Conservation Alliance is a local Prince William nonprofit, and we're working to establish sustainable communities, promote environmental stewardship, and create opportunities for residents to engage in decisions that affect the quality of our lives and the future of our community. I would like to um, say also give a big thank you to our um, donors and members whose contributions make programs like this possible. And it's really important for us all to get together and to even on Zoom to meet some other people, but to know what the issues are in the county and to find out more and to learn about how, what you can do and how you can get involved. In that light, I'm going to um, share my screen for a minute, I think. And invite you all to our fundraising event on June 5th, which we have, as you can see here, a great lineup, including an opera singer, which I'm so excited about. She's just terrific. And then a series of seven minute presentations on some of the hot issues of today. So you can learn more about this on our website. And hopefully we will see you there. Any donation you choose to make from $5 to $50 is very appreciated by us. And if you would like to make a donation just in general, you can do that right from our webpage and do that safely online. So stop share. And tonight we are going to be talking about deer in our backyards, which everybody I'm sure is familiar with. And many of us who have to buy new shrubs every year because of the deer would like to know more about managing them and, and how to do that. In Prince William County, the county ran a um, hunting program at some of our county parks for three years and it was very successful. After the three years, however, in this past year, they've stopped the program saying that they need to have additional funding for a person to manage the program, which we hope comes soon. It doesn't have to be expensive. It can be a temporary seasonal position. And there's lots of ways to um, continue what turned out to be a really successful program. So we are very fortunate to have with us tonight, Jordan Green from the Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources. And he has been a district terrestrial wildlife biologist in Northern Virginia for the last two years. He graduated from Virginia Tech with a degree in wildlife science. His previous work includes a career focused on a wide variety of plant and animal species in nine different states with various organizations, including federal, state, and a nonprofit. Before his current position, Jordan worked as a bear biologist for the state of Florida. And we are also delighted to have Charles Smith here. Charles is a naturalist, ecologist with 29 years of experience in Northern Virginia, including 14 years of deer management in Fairfax County. He is a restoration ecologist focusing on Virginia natural communities. In addition to working with Prince William Conservation Alliance, he's representing the Virginia Native Plant Society. Charles is a local native and a US Army vet he leads a tour at the Bluebell Festival every year. He's an important resource for many projects in Prince William, and we are delighted to have him with us tonight. So welcome, Charles. And I guess, Charles, are you going to kick off and start? I'm happy to do that, Kim. Okay, we didn't actually talk about that. Is that good with you, Jordan? Absolutely. Okay, so Charles... You, uh... Kim, how do you want to divide our time? We're about 10 after now. We want to finish up the presentations by eight. Is that correct? Yep. All right. So we, we split it down the middle. I'll go about 25 minutes and turn it over to Jordan. Yes. And I should say that to um, everybody, too. We'll go through the presentations when they're done, which will be in two 25-minute bursts. Then we'll ask questions and have a conversation. And you can share your stories and ideas. 
in the meantime, we're all on mute and I'm gonna turn the program over to Charles. Oh, and I should also say, does everybody know how to raise their hand in case you have a question in between? Feel free to do that and we'll get to it. Or you can also write your comments in the chat. You're on Charles. Great. Uh, let me get to hopefully share here. Um, second here. Hold on one second. It's choosing to have a little bit of a connection. Second here. Um, All right, can you see my see my presentation? Yep. Great, okay. Well, I'm gonna be with you for next uh, 20 minutes or so and talk a bit about deer management. I really appreciate the opportunity, Kim and Ashley and others. And um, the, the key is, I think for me, is uh, my focus will be on the ecological impacts while Jordan is gonna be your expert coming from the wildlife management uh, perspective at the state level. Um, and this this bird, by the way, this is a I've been was fortunate enough to be granted permission years ago by Kim to borrow some photographs. This is Julie Flanagan's photo of an oven bird. If you're not familiar, an oven bird is one of our local warbler species that actually makes most of its living on the forest floor, and it nests on the forest floor. And without good vegetative cover and native plants to provide the insects it needs to forage, the, the oven bird cannot survive. And it's that removal of vegetation from the forest that the, the deer impact is the most severe. Most of us are familiar with uh, images like this where deer have become uh, extremely abundant in our landscapes and they're, they're very adaptive to human, human modified landscapes. So they can live in forests, uh, but they're also super abundant, actually more abundant in these mosaics that we create with lots of edge habitat and mowed grass. The deer can't actually eat mature grass because it's, they're not grazers, they're browsers. But this fertilized lawn that we mow regularly has soft leaves that do not, do not have a high silica content and deer are able to eat that. But they're really specialized browsers on broadleaf plants and they eat a lot of acorns and things like that also. One of the things I learned years ago, you know, I was always thought that, well, you know, we should just reintroduce predators. But what was made apparent to me at a, a conference in Maryland probably 15 years ago is that humans have actually been the dominant predators in North America for about 13,000 years. And the management of white-tailed deer populations, although in the past it did include wolves, uh, you know, mountain lions, um, in reality it was primarily humans that managed the, the deer. So uh, we have merely change and this last image is actually a, a sketch I believe by John White uh, in early in colonial times in Virginia um, and we have changed in the sense that humans had become the dominant predators and what shifted during after colonization is that we went as agriculture became abundant uh, we also switched to a market hunting format and market hunting is really what damaged po wildlife populations. At the same time we were cutting down forests and modifying the land for agriculture, we also massively overhunted a huge number of species, not just deer, but, uh, waterfowl, fish, and, 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 it's, and the others. So in this case, subsistence hunting as well as market hunting had a massive impact. And by about 1900, deer had been reduced to very low levels in Virginia. We're, all, we're locally extinct actually in many places. And the state began a reintroduction program. Um, I think the key is, I actually go back one slide, is this reduction, reintroduction program continued through about 1980 with slow, low numbers of restocking from uh, seven different states as well as from counties where deer had not been extirpated. And um, this number uh, has risen dramatically. And I think the key is, is that humans no longer hunted deer for subsistence or market purposes because they were regulated. And so the deer quickly outstripped the, the ability of humans to manage them without uh, a, lot of, a lot of pressure on the herds. So another thing that occurred in the 20th century, in addition to recovering deer populations and switching over to a hunting model, 
um, that was regulated, we also began to really develop the concept of the gentleman hunter. I don't mean to leave women out of it, it's just that men dominated the hunting scene for, for decades. And they also were very focused on harvesting large males, which is not is very counterintuitive to any type of management of a population where traditionally predators would take the weakest, um, they would select the animals that they were most easy to obtain. But we were, we stood uh, for the 20th century, we're very focused on taking large bucks and develop this concept that somehow anything other than this, uh, what they would consider sport, sportsman-like hunting uh, was, was not something people should do. Uh, and that's really, again, counter to what predators do, which is select out uh, the weakest animals. They take it by the, by the, by the easiest way possible. Another thing that happened in the 20th century is changing. We became more and more uh, urban in our focus and people's attitudes towards wildlife really became rather skewed. We went from largely extirpating many species by about 1900 to taking this very hands-off approach and, pre and pretending that what was left uh, were these very delicate animals that, that we needed to you know, just stay away from, we could not have interaction with. Uh, and there were negative images developed by movies like Bambi, which came out in 1942, where it was these you know species were considered now that you know hunters were bad, fires bad, all these things are bad. Um, and what's interesting, one of the things about Bambi is not only does it change that perspective, but it also in this image, the only species that's not adaptive really is the owl. And actually, some of the owl species are adaptive, but almost everything pictured in this image are species that can actually live where humans live. Actually, I should say the butterfly is probably one that couldn't either. But the, um, these are, you know, whether it's a raccoon or a rabbit, a skunk, a deer, uh, these are animals that can, that can actually live in human-altered human landscapes. So this is a very skewed image, which disproportionately aims people's perspective of wildlife and adaptive species and takes their, their mind off of the things that cannot adapt, whether it's to human habitat alteration or to deer habitat alteration. Another thing we started doing is we started idolizing Native Americans who, of course, we had villainized in the past and also largely uh, wiped out in many areas um, as being what we called the noble savage. And that's concept that somehow Native Americans did not touch uh, wildlife and lived in perfect harmony. Well, I can't, you know, certainly uh, many Native Americans had a phenomenal view of uh, the natural world. They lived more in tune with it. At the same time, there were also Native Americans who, uh, put significant pressure on local wildlife resources and natural resources. Uh, and, and also we're humans like ourselves in many ways. They, they were simply trying to survive and, and often put a lot of pressure on things and didn't necessarily always live in balance with them. So what's happened now, it's changed dramatically, of course, is the degree to which we've altered the earth. We have dramatically changed the landscape and fragmented the landscape, and we have made it more difficult for most native plants and animals to, to really make a good living. And certainly with climate change coming, difficult for those organisms to adapt and move and, and to respond to climate change. But we've made it a good place for deer. So this habitat that we've altered, and this is a picture of the Shenandoah Valley off of Massanutten Mountain, that valley floor is almost nothing native. The valley floor is a lot of introduced species from Europe and Asia that were brought for human agriculture and horticulture and or were escapees. And they, um, they are not providing forage for native insects and birds and the other related species. But for deer, there actually is forage there and they can live in the forest on the edge, but they can also live in the modified landscape in the middle. And there are massive numbers of deer in agricultural areas that often will exploit some of the same resources as the livestock. Uh, the other thing we've done, of course, is create these massively oversimplified communities where we have mowed grass and a few ornamental plants from some other continent where we again can't support native species, uh, whether it be plant or insect or other. Uh, but deer, again, can adapt to this landscape. And indeed, they're found in our yards now. We find them in really urban areas. It's amazing where you'll see deer. Uh, matter of fact, this pellet group is on a sidewalk which is outside the Fairfax County Government Center, in the middle of Fairfax County, near Fair Oaks Mall. Uh, you can't get much more urban. This is, a, this is a fairly typical urban landscape and deer are in it. Uh, as I mentioned before, deer share this landscape with other adaptive species, such as raccoons, 
uh, cottontail rabbits, gray squirrels. They can all make it in that environment. Um, this map on the left is the conservation corridor map that was developed by the Northern Virginia Regional Commission uh, a number of years ago, and it tries to show uh, areas where we could link remaining natural corridors back together and heal the landscape. Uh, but it also exhibits the fragmentation level of the land. And, and there, what it doesn't really show is those spaces between the green are often modified to the point where invasive species dominate. And uh, again, there are not many um, native species that, that can persist there in good numbers. So to just kind of really reemphasize the degree to which we've modified the landscape, this image is an attempt to show the biomass of vertebrates left on Earth. And uh, it shows you the gr dark gray in the middle are, is us, that's humans. The light gray is our livestock. And the green dots are what's left of wild things, all wild things on Earth, whether it be a salamander, a bird, any terrestrial animal, uh, that's it. And that includes uh, the species that we think of, you, know, you think of abundant places on Earth. There are very few organisms left that are wild. Um, so it's really the biomass has been converted to us. Um, the, the other thing I think to remember is landscapes could recover in the past under the right conditions. Shenandoah National Park was the first national park established to restore, not protect, wilderness. This is what it looked like when it was created. It had actually been timber harvested and the trees had been used for uh, fuel, for pig iron furnaces, and for, for um, timber products. So they started restoring that land. And by you know, the time I was a kid in the 70s, going through Shenandoah National Park, I thought this was an ancient forest. In actuality, much of it was only about 40 or 50 years old. Um, it, but it was able to recover because when they did the timber harvest, they did not destroy the soil. So there were all the seeds, roots, and spores of those native plants were left, as well as a lot of the soil organisms. And there were patches of uh, core forest areas left. And once you took the human uh, land disturbance pressure off, there were not invasive species. Instead, you got things like southern harebells, and you got this native um, Joe Pieweed, or you, 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 Eupatorium. Um, and this is uh, Allegheny stonecrop, another native that looks a lot like the uh, sedum that you would buy for your yard, but it's a native. But these were able to persist again because we had not eliminated all the seed source and all the animals that were associated with them. We used to learn that if we took the pressure off of things, they would recover, but it's no longer the case because we've, again, we destroy the soil comp components, which have all that seed source, all the genetic material. But in addition, we've introduced invasives and these invasives include plant species such as these wisteria and English ivy. Uh, this is um, autumn olive, really disruptive uh, shrub that was planted for uh, wildlife food and for soil conservation. And this is a oriental bittersweet, it's an ornamental plant, which is tremendously impactful on forested areas in particular. And these plants uh, outcompete a lot of natives and they thrive in disturbed soils. And some of them actually alter the soils themselves and suppress native plants. So again, once you take away human soil disturbance, we've taken away that seed source. And instead, we've, re we've introduced all these other plants which try to fill those niches and they don't, they don't feed the native insects. Those insects are on decline in massive numbers. And then the other thing we've done is we've not controlled deer. So one of the things with deer population management, which, and Jordan will talk a bit more about this under the way that the hunting regulations work, is that most times you read about game management, they're focused on two things, biological carrying capacity and cultural carrying capacity. Biological carrying capacity is the number of organisms that a landscape can support until that, that organism's population crashes. So it'd be you know, until the deer actually could, were starving to death and could not eat. But in an altered landscape, especially with all the human food resources, that's not gonna happen. Uh, and a cultural carrying capacity is the degree to which we tolerate those animals, which is lower than the biological. But what's completely missed is the ecological carrying capacity. And that number is extremely low. We've exceeded that long ago. I took this picture in my old backyard off of Bent Tree Lane, which is off of uh, uh, Davis Ford Road 
in just near Manassas. And this was where the deer were eating the mountain laurel in my yard. They were so desperate. When deer have gotten to that point, they have stripped the landscape bare of almost every other native plant that they can reach. Uh, it was in 2008, the USDA Forest Service published this in the National Register, this article on the left, which basically stated that east of the Mississippi, deer were altering the, our forests and were the, were the number one threat to forest resources in the United States, um, or in, in this particular case, east of the Mississippi. So we know that human habitat alteration is the, really the number one threat, but after human habitat modification, it's deer browse. And it's our inability to, to control deer down to the numbers, which is about 15 to 20 deer per square mile in eastern forests. Um, in actuality, to recover those, those same resources, getting deer below that number is ideal for a while. But we've not been able to get much lower than probably 40 to 50 to 60 deer per square mile, even where hunting is being used. Most studies show they cannot be reduced below about 43 to 45 deer per square mile without using extreme things like baiting. Um, so, so hunting models have been used, but not enough people hunt. And there are, you know, it's, it's, it's very important to get those numbers down as low as you can. Um, to, to get an idea of kind of altered habitats and good versus bad in terms of the quality of our habitats. These two parks are in Fairfax County. The one on the left was not impacted by human land disturbance in the 20th century, has low invasives, and until recently had very low deer browse. The one on the right was the same original forest community type. Uh, the large tree in each picture is the same species, about the same size, except the one on the right was heavily altered by humans. It, invasive species are, are, are all on the edge in the, in the farther part of the image. And then in the, the near ground, it's been completely browsed out by white-tailed deer. There's no regeneration. So here's that damaged uh, landscape. It's heavily fragmented, invasive species, deer browse. And then here's the one that has been, um, has been fortunate enough not to be heavily human disturbed, has intact native flora, and uh, also has low invasives. And again, they were originally the same plant community, just a couple miles apart. So deer are really a keystone species. They, they uh, can change ecosystem integrity. They can alter the trajectory for the forest of that community. And really the outcomes of um, ecosystem management are, are predicated on your ability to control or at least work around deer browse. Just to give you some examples of where deer can stay in check, these are the key deer. It's the smallest subspecies of the whitetail. This is down Big Pine Key in Florida. And these are tiny animals. Um, that bumper on that uh, van, that's a, that's a doe and that's her fawn behind her uh, yearling. The, the yearling is, its back is about where the license plate is. Uh, there's actually a fawn in this image, it's to the left of the image, that is it was as high as my shin. And the reason these animals are small is partly that island effect where they are on a smaller shrinking area with, with fewer resources. But they have spent uh, thousands of years now isolated and they're eating very tough vegetation. And that vegetation limits their nutrition so these deer are shrunk to adapt to their food resource. And that vegetation can effectively resist a lot of the deer browse. This deer herds in Tyson's Corner. So if you don't think they can live anywhere, uh, this is 13 deer in this particular herd. And I, I've worked in that system now for years and there are deer there every day and they've stripped the system bare. This is a pretty typical forest in Prince William County. This particular image actually was taken in Fairfax, but right next to the Prince William line. And uh, it's been completely browsed out by white-tailed deer. When that happens, the root systems of the plants slowly shrink, and eventually the plants go locally extinct. And there's great data from across Virginia and across the eastern U.S. showing the, the local extinction of plants due to deer browse. When that happens, this is a system in western um, Fairfax, but it's a system that also occurs in Prince William County. Um, and there's, there's actually a tremendous number of species that could occur in these systems that don't now. Now this image is a Vigella leaf slipper orchid that I actually took in um, Prince William Forest Park. I mean, excuse me, not Prince William Forest Park, in um, Conway Robinson State Forest after deer hunting had, had been implemented. This plant is now being able to persist at least in low numbers, but it's not where the deer browse is excessive. 
This is a four leaf milkweed, also at Conway Robinson. And again, it's because of the hunting pressure, Conway Robinson has allowed some of these plants to recover. Although the, there's not full regeneration going on in that forest stand, the hunting has allowed some really important native species to persist. Uh, this is the um, this is Virginia snake root, and it's the host plant to that caterpillar, which is pipevine swallowtail, and that's the adult. That plant, that organism cannot persist without that plant. It uh, three stages of the life cycle occur in forests, and it's the host plant species that are critical for the for once that the egg hatches for the for the larva to persist and then effectively pupate. Without those plants, this butterfly will disappear. A magnolia warbler. They were reliant on insects that eat on our native plants. And again, without the native plants, which the deer are browsing out, we don't have insects and we don't have warblers. So another thing to remember is these plants feed the soil profile and everything underneath the soil is dependent upon the sugars coming out of our native plants that are working in this massive network with fungi connecting the root systems of different species. And the soil microbes are dependent upon that feeding. And that includes our periodical cicadas. Without the, uh, the healthy native plant communities of oak dominant forest primarily, we won't get our periodical cicadas. And this is, a, this is pictures of the brood tin in 2012 and from my yard in Prince William County. And again, without those uh, root exudates and healthy native species, especially oaks, which are eliminated in the regeneration process by deer browse, we will not have these. I'm just thinking about the impacts of those same um, browse on forested systems. This is a vernal pool complex, but the forest around it is what feeds the, um, and the insects that live in that forest, feed these organisms such as cricket frog, which that picture was taken, by the way, at uh, Merrimack. On the right, then you have sp uh, spotted salamander. And, oh, and those, those are living, they breed in the pools, but they are living as adults in those woods, not in the pools. Uh, so that habitat that for all these bird species and foraging, and that, by the way, that picture in the background is taken at Helwig Park in an area that had been hunted for years or with uh, pressure, so it had good uh, forest structure. Um, you wouldn't have the, the birds that need to live in those systems. So again, the deer is just an amazing animal. It's, uh, they're so adaptive and able to digest almost anything, um, but it's, it requires pressure in order to keep its numbers in check. Uh, this is a picture in Western Fairfax where deer browse had gotten so bad, they actually were hedging beech trees that could not grow, which is pretty unusual because they're pretty resistant to deer browse. Thinking about a species that can be controlled by predation without humans, this is the Eastern Meadow Vole, which is the most uh, prevalent vertebrate species in North America. Actually, I take that back, mammal species. Uh, they can be highly dense in field systems that are healthy and actually control uh, tree species from being able to uh, go through succession within fields. But they've got tons of predators, including uh, black racers and foxes, uh, northern harriers, and red-tailed hawks. All eat uh, meadow voles, so they've got tons of natural predators. But with deer, it's not the case. So the primary impacts from deer are human safety, human health, economic impacts, and environmental. And Jordan's going to spend more time on the first three and talk a bit about them. I'm going to spend some time on the last one. I'm also going to, don't want to run too long here. So I'm going to try to speed up, get to some of these next slides, and go through some of the environmental impacts again before I turn it over to Jordan. So just thinking about the browse impacts, uh, deer, deer vehicle collisions are a reality. This is, in, uh, this is right off 236, uh, right in Manassas, just uh, north of 66 as you're approaching. Uh, this would be looking south back towards Manassas. Um, right there in the, in the, you know, next to the guardrail, the deer are everywhere in our area. Uh, and of course, they, they carry ticks and are heavily infested with them. And there's things like chronic wasting disease. Uh, and impacts to both crops as well as uh, ornamental plants have a huge economic impact across the country. And the key is, is that again, as I mentioned, if you have uh, pre effective predators, you can keep your numbers in check. But when you don't, the deer are able to convert plant biomass to deer and remove plants and alter the system so you don't get other organisms. Um, but 
this key thing I, in this poster I always like to refer to is the, on the left, you've got unregulated deer as well as really bad landscape practices, which is typical throughout our region. On the right, you have better landscape practices and hunting pressure, and you can put a system back in balance. And it has to do with choices by all of us. All of us have a role. Uh, and it really takes a lot of people to create a healthy landscape. Um, so deer management options were identified by the Northeast Deer Technical Committee in 2009. And a lot of these don't apply to us because we can't allow nature to take its course. So we've been doing that, it's not gonna work. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the repellents and fencing, non-lethal techniques, um, but I'll focus on the ones that actually were identified as being potentially effective. So no action, passive measures, which are, are things that um, like uh, fencing, uh, contraception, sterilization, non-human predators, and population control by humans. So exclusion with fencing has a limited application. You can exclude areas. The fences can be very expensive, but they also have to be maintained. Um, this is a, a black mesh fence, which is actually pretty popular. It can be effective over smaller areas. Uh, some people do it over acres. In Pennsylvania, they've actually fenced off huge areas, but it takes a lot of resources and you have to maintain the fencing. Uh, these pictures on the left is from Fairfax County Park. On the upper right is at Penn State up in, up in Pennsylvania. They've done some massive exclosures that, as you can see, are very effective at regenerating. And on the lower right is at Wood End in Maryland. Uh, this is the uh, Audubon Natural Society headquarters. They put up a massive fence trying to uh, restore their 20-acre headquarters site. Here's another thing uh, recently we've done through work and restoration plantings. On the left, we planted containerized stock that was larger, it was taller, and, and it was much more resistant to deer browse. We're able to recover that site. On the right is a site that was planted directly adjacent to it with seedlings, and they're not per, uh, performing through competition with other plants, but largely through deer browse. So uh, planting strategies can make a difference in recovering landscapes. Contraception and sterilization, um, they're, they're highly regulated. They have to be directly injected into the animal. Uh, there are dark gun options in some cases, but the hand uh, administration is the other, uh, is the part that's been authorized. They don't work. Even in closed populations, the studies have shown that those deer, you cannot get enough of them sterilized to prevent re uh, reproduction at a rate that replaces and or surpasses the current population. And even with closed populations, deer manage to get in and out. So their, their, their numbers uh, increase over time. So they're not being able to control, and, and in open populations, it's, it's simply not feasible. You can't sterilize enough deer. The surgical sterilization at the bottom was a good example of that. City of Fairfax tried it at huge expenses and it was completely ineffective. So it's not effective to try to artificially control these populations through chemicals or uh, biological agents or sterilization. Uh, predators are not effective. Um, our largest predator, we don't have mountain lions. We don't have wolves anymore. We do have coyotes, but they're not effective predators of deer. They eat a lot of roadkill. There are some, um, some uh, examples and, and records of them taking injured animals, uh, occasionally, as a pack, we'll take down a deer, but it's not something they, they focus on. Uh, they're not particularly effective at it. And again, it's humans that have controlled deer for decades. So uh, just to review our options um, for we have the, the impacts are on the left, safety, health, economic, ecological. Our options are along the top, fencing, uh, food or landscaping, repellents, contraception, or lethal control. The fencing can have very limited effectiveness over smaller areas. So you can fence, effectively keep deer out, but you have to maintain it. It's pretty expensive and you can't do it over a very large area. Food and landscaping is not really effective. You can't feed deer in one place and expect them not to eat another. Uh, repellents have a limited effectiveness. They usually last for a little while, but the deer often overcome them, especially the hungrier they get. Contraception is not effective, and that's been proven through studies. Uh, it's absolutely true, it's not effective. And lethal control has been shown to be effective in some areas, and there are examples directly in Prince William County where that's occurred, like Conway Robinson, where although they've not achieved forest regeneration, we have recovered plants. And that's the key, recovering plants and slowly working towards getting regeneration are the key goals. Um, so Jordan will talk about the deer management plan for Virginia. 
just a little bit about other counties. Fairfax County is an active hunting program. It's been in effect for years, and there have been local uh, instances where this program has really helped out. There's a lot of participation. Um, this is uh, thinking again about forests. Uh, archery program in Fairfax has been implemented for, for you know, since 2009. Been very effective. There's no human um, safety issue. We talked about this from Prince William when we when we uh, worked to get the um, regulations modified to allow archery hunting again, and it's been it's been very uh, proven to be true that it's not a threat to human safety with archers that are in elevated stands shooting downward at deer that are stationary. Uh, and then the thinking about the things we want to recover. This is just a picture of a strawberry bush, a native of common shrub that rarely gets to actually flower and reproduce because of deer browse, but we can recover those. Uh, just a little, just a little bit. Of, this slide just a little bit about hunting in the region. And then this is a picture of Gettysburg National Battlefield Park where sharpshooting occurred and you uh, can see regeneration happening almost right away. I did get an email back, by the way, from uh, Brian Garcia at Manassas Battlefield. He did indicate they've had three years of sharpshooting and he's seeing more young trees in the forest than he's ever seen before after being there for a long time. So he feels that in their spotlight surveys are showing reduced overall deer numbers per square mile. So he feels the sharpshooting is having an effect. I mean, it will be a while before you can really see a, a true regeneration, but he is the initial indications are the sharpshooting of Manassas is, ha is helping. And just thinking about, this is down in my, where I used to live in uh, near Prince, um, near Manassas. This is um, goat's rue. It's a really amazing plant that is largely eliminated with deer browse from our landscapes. Not much left in Prince William County. Um, that same road trailing Arbutus is almost completely wiped out. It's, it's not a common plant anymore, but it could be a common plant in parts of Prince William if there wasn't browse. Um, this is um, uh, viburnum uh, cerifolium or maple leaf viburnum, very common, but again, negatively impacted by deer. And this is thimbleweed. This picture is also in that same part of Prince William County, but the deer are, eat this plant usually before it gets big enough. But if you have some uh, effective hunting, it actually can keep this, let this plant actually grow. I'm gonna wind down here because I know I gotta turn it over to Jordan. Just think about a lot of the many things that we could have in our landscapes that we don't have with deer browse. And this is our native, um, this is our state butterfly. This is the the um, the tiger swallowtail. This is my picture in my front yard in Prince William County of the larva. And they feed largely on tulip trees and then they pupate in the forest. And then of course head out as adults to, to uh, this is foraging in my front yard in Manassas. So this is a plant, uh, an animal again, is totally dependent on forest for three stages of its life cycle. And it has to have the native plants in order to survive. So with that, I think we're gonna turn it over to Jordan. And uh, this was the last thing, but let me uh, unshare my screen. Get this out of here. I know I started talking fast here to try to catch up. I hope I didn't lose anybody. All right, so let me turn it over to Jordan so he can continue. All right, can everybody hear me? Okay, all right, and anybody can see my screen. All right, so I'm the, the Northern Virginia District Terrestrial Wildlife Biologist for um, the Department of Wildlife Resources. We were formerly the Department of Game and Inland Fisheries, uh, but we've changed our name last July 1st to better reflect all the things that we cover. Um, so uh, one of the, the primary kind of guiding light of how we manage wildlife in Virginia is, is based off of something called the uh, North American model of wildlife management. It has seven main tenants. It basically boils down to we don't commercialize our wildlife and wildlife is managed as a public trust, uh, meaning that we manage wildlife for the good of everyone. Um, and so one of, one of the things that Charles had mentioned was ecological carrying capacity and how we manage uh, wildlife in, 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 the, in North America is, is kind of based off this idea of where are we at what, with uh, the maximum a uh, landscape can sustain biologically versus what is the maximum a landscape can 
uh, sustain when uh, you consider human attitudes, opinions, and values towards that wildlife. Uh, so there's a little bit of a tug of war between different interests. Um, it's our job, I think, as an agency just to make sure that nobody's happy, but wildlife are still thriving. <laughs> um, so our deer management plan, we actually do have a very robust plan that kind of outlines how we how we uh, go about managing wildlife, as in this case, deer in, in the state of Virginia. It's uh, up for review in 2024. It basically directs all of our uh, management programs across the board, whether you're a private public landowner, um, a native uh, Virginian resident, a visitor, et cetera. And like I said, th this is really reflects the North American model. This is in best interest of all citizens. Uh, when these management plans get put together, we really consider um, what the uh, the input from from various uh, stakeholders across the state um, it covers a really in-depth history of deer in Virginia what their current status are what their uh, all the programs that we have available our goals our objectives and this is not an operational plan this is not a here's here's the paperwork go in, and hunt deer with it this is more of a strategic plan um, that talks some more about uh, kind of uh, where we want to be in, in, in um, managing our wildlife. Uh, so this is our, our deer population objectives for the state of Virginia. As you can see in, in the northern areas of Virginia, we want to reduce deer. Uh, this is our private land objectives and similar for public land. Um, the areas uh, with the the hotter colors are areas that have more deer. So Loudoun County, um, Frederick, Warren, Clark, Fauquier, Prince William, we're, we're, you're starting to see, uh, historically we've had a lot of a high number of deer in these areas. Um, after deer were reestablished in Virginia, they really took off up here and, and, and they've been doing a little too well. Um, so, our objectives are to reduce the population, and I'll get into why that is, but uh, really in Prince William County, you see that white arrow in Fairfax County, that white arrow, we really want these deer to be uh, is the least abundant um, as they can be, and here's the reasons why. So we look at how we measure deer. Um, our, our deer population index comes from basically our harvest data. It's an antlered buck kill per square mile of estimated deer habitat um, and this this gives us an annual index of, of deer populations in Virginia um, and uh, this in conjunction with you know stakeholder involvement surveys uh, we get an idea of where we want to be for for deer and so right now for uh, private land uh, we're just on the line between moderate and low as far as uh, the, uh, where our index is. And then for public land, uh, we're a little bit higher. We're still in the moderate side of things and we're wanting to get public and both private down to the very low side. And so one of the factors that's involved in that, in a, in a major factor uh, for cultural carrying capacity is our, our willingness to tolerate uh, collisions with deer. Uh, there are occasionally fatalities, uh, human fatalities, when it comes to deer um, vehicle collisions. So this is this is data uh, taken uh, by State Farm, and this includes all animals. Um, your chances of an encounter one in seventy four in Virginia. Um, that number is actually a lot higher, uh, considering that the uh, the reporting thresholds for damage that's uh, uh, reported. Uh, in some cases, depending on the agency um, or the uh, insurance agency, we're looking at about a $1,500 minimum before it's reported. So in some cases, we really uh, don't know just the extent of how bad the problem is. Here in Northern Virginia, we definitely pay a higher price for that uh, in our insurance rates and our premiums um, because it, it is uh, an economic impact. Uh, and then uh, another major issue we're facing 
and, and many of you should be familiar with uh, wildlife uh, disease and how it's transmitted to humans in some cases with the recent advent of COVID. Uh, but chronic wasting disease, a disease that's a neurologic disease in deer, um, it is 100% fatal in deer. Uh, clinical signs, they really, it's, it's basically they just uh, lose all of their natural instincts and they they start to literally waste away. They, they'll drool, they stand with a sawhorse wide stance, their heads always drooping down, their ears will be drooping down, and they're usually very emaciated because they just forget how to be deer. They don't eat anymore, uh, they, they'll just stand and stare. Um, and this is caused by an infectious protein called a, a prion. It's not a um, bacteria, it's not a virus, it's not easily destroyed and it can persist in the environment for years. Um, and you can't tell if a deer has it just by looking at it. Um, the deer probably can have it up to three years really before they start to show symptoms. And once they start to show symptoms, they've got about a month to live. Now, there's no way to treat it. There's no way to cure it uh, currently. Um, like it, like I said, a, a prion is just a misfolded piece of DNA. It fits into the uh, protein locks of the of the brain, and then it just re replicates and, and starts creating holes in the brain. Um, animals that aren't uh, don't even show symptoms can spread uh, the disease. Uh, uh, it's spread between uh, contact with deer saliva, um, feces, urine. And the proteins themselves can survive in the environment for years. Uh, they can be taken up into plants, actually, that other deer come along and eat. So this is a really serious uh, disease. Uh, started in, uh, as far as we can tell, in the late 60s, uh, we had our first real positives of the symptoms in Colorado. And it has been uh, kind of spreading ever since. Uh, it first came into Virginia in 2009. Um, and on the map on the right there, you can see it came in through West Virginia, through Frederick County, and has been spreading ever since. Um, uh, we haven't had as much spread this year, which is good news, but the previous year uh, we had new positives in Loudoun, Fauquier, Rappahannock, and Madison counties all in one year. I fully expect this to continue marching forward. And from a biological perspective, really the best management tool we have is to reduce the deer population ahead of the uh, this disease marching forward because it, it really is a, a density dependent uh, disease. Uh, like, like with many wildlife populations, the more dense the population is, the more rapidly the disease spreads. Um, so some of these that are, we, uh, Charles did a really good job of already covering, but um, again, these are the environmental impacts. On your left is an, an unbroused habitat, uh, whereas on the right, you can see six feet up, you can see all the way to the, in, over the hill. Um, so I won't get into too much of the ecological impact, but again, just more just to reiterate that this, the deer really do have an impact in our, in our lives and it does affect us in the sense that it really uh, dis is a detriment to the diversity of the wildlife that we see. And that detriment uh, in our wildlife, it increases the chances of things for such things as disease um, and invasive plants to take over. Uh, again, the ornamentals being destroyed. Um, so when it comes to what are our management solutions, um, really non-lethal ex exclusion, uh, Charles mentioned fencing, uh, repellents, chemicals, dogs, um, selecting specific plants, when we plant them, how old they plant, where we plant them, uh, definitely not feeding deer, and of course population reduction. So exclusion, uh, very effective but very costly in some cases. Uh, one of the things that uh, to keep in mind at deer are more visible when moving. This is uh, typically in times when, uh, sometimes when food shortages require larger movements. Uh, and this is why we'll see a lot more damage in uh, the winter time uh, when deer are looking for forage. Um, 
but again, um, back to electric fencing, this is uh, another method that has to be maintained. It's expensive to install and very expensive to maintain, depending on how big the area is. On our website, their area, um, you can learn more about uh, different what fencing designs and how, how to install those properly. Um, chemical repellents, a note on these, uh, there are different uh, brands and companies out there. Uh, there's good, good evidence that it does work, but it works just as long until the next rainstorm. Some of them have some surfactants on there that'll they'll still work after a rain or two, but you'll have to reapply, which means you're, you're spending money. Um, and then on top of it, deer can actually in time get used to the, the repellent and you'll have to switch up the repellents. Um, and note about home remedies, uh, that's actually an illegal thing to do. Um, for deer, uh, really, uh, some of these things are uh, just not recommended by our Virginia Department of Agriculture. Um, so one, just to, again, there's certain species of plants that deer don't like. Um, at, at for, for instance, uh, American beech that Charles mentioned there towards the end of his presentation that uh, if you're starting to see some of these plants getting browsed by deer, you, you know you really have a hard deer problem because they're they're so uh, limited in the resources that they can feed on that they're really going after things that they wouldn't ordinarily eat. Uh, guard dogs, again, um, not not always possible for everybody, depending on your situation, and really not a silver bullet. Um, deer can adapt to you know, timing of when dogs are around, they can, they know when dogs are around and can still come in and create that damage. Um, and then feeding deer is a really major problem as far as, uh, you know, helping to contribute more food in equals more deer out. But also, um, as you can see all the lines uh, in this forest where deer are coming and going, if they're congregating in an area uh, thinking about CWD, where it's transmitted between the urine, feces, saliva, you're really creating this uh, kind of super spreader event when you're when you're feeding. We all know what that is now. So, it, and it is actually illegal to feed deer in our disease management areas, uh, and in any counties that were within a 25 mile radius of the nearest CWD positive. So that includes Stafford County. Prince William County is not there yet, but it could happen. Um, and then, of course, we don't allow uh, feeding outside uh, during the hunting season. So what we're left with is population reduction, and I'm not talking about Tai Chi and uh, aerobic exercise. <laughs> um, so as far as a state agency goes, our role are, uh, in, in helping uh, municipalities with urban deer management. We offer a variety of programs and options that are available. Uh, this basically comes down to some regulated hunting, uh, issuing of kill permits. Uh, this is kind of like our sharpshooter programs and things like that. Um, uh, and then uh, really providing education. This is this presentation is, is one of those tools, getting information out there for the people understand what non-lethal options are capable of, what the lethal options are capable of. Um, we do not conduct urban deer removal operations for municipalities. There's just not enough of us. I wish there, <laughs> wish there were more of us, but, um, and we do not conduct deer population surveys uh, for communities or localities. Again, that's just a resource issue. Um, and I'll get into a little bit more why that's not recommended. But, uh, but what we really want to do is we want to enable um, local deer management. P people that have an interest in doing this, um, we're going to try and do everything we can to make sure that it's an opportunity for people rather than being an impediment to it. So for local government, their role in urban deer management is for themselves determine what's the threshold for their, their management action. Um, we really rec strongly recommend conducting assessments to monitor the residents opinions. Again, this is that cultural carrying capacity and the, Im and the impacts of deer, you know, ecologically on the, on the areas around. What we don't recommend is a deer population um, estimate. Um, once you come up with a number of deer, okay, now you have a number of deer, you have one number that doesn't really tell you so much as to what the, uh, the effects of that number are, are much more important. Um, 
So developing uh, programs with us uh, and then choosing appropriate management options that are consistent with the local law and authority. And in some cases, we, you know, changing the local law and authority to be able to accommodate some of these programs is, is the key. Um, so in summary, there's, there are a variety of programs available. The focus is on antlerless deer rec reduction. Charles mentioned kind of the turn of the century the, the gentleman hunter that's taking the, the antlered buck um, was really kind of the culture that's counterproductive to what we wanna do as far as managing deer herds. And there really are non-lethal options really have a limited effect. And I wanna uh, reiterate something Charles mentioned about uh, contraceptives and sterilization as much as I'd want that to work and it would be a fun part of my job to get to do. I uh, just, the plain truth is it's just not effective. It's very cost effective, cost uh, prohibitive. And even when you have the money to do it, it, it you're really just spinning your wheels. Um, it just takes just a, a couple of, you know, misses and you have continue to have a deer issue. So regulated hunt, hunting in mind, um, this is for last year's uh, regulate uh, hunters digest. Uh, the, these are the, the rules, the time of when you can hunt. Um, and this comes out, I think a new one comes out in July that describes all of the things that can be done and can't be done. Um, but I just wanted to touch base on that. This is highly regulated within the state. We definitely don't want to lose our deer. We're not in the business of eradicating deer. We really, again, this goes back to the North American model that we're, we're not we're not in the business of of treating deer for our own interests we're we're managing deer for the interests of everyone and so that 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 animal uh, can exist on the landscape forever for for future generations um so in closing um an alo leopold quote problem of game management is not how shall we handle the deer the real problem is one of human management <laughs> so, so with that i'll uh I'll leave it back to Kim and uh, I think we'll open it for questions. Yes, and who we need to everybody be on mute. Somebody's making a bunch of noise. There, I think I got it. <coughs> no, so can you if you can just check and make sure you're on mute, that'd be great. Does anybody have comments, questions? I see somebody in the chat. Oh, from Jocelyn, I agree. We should all mute. <laughs> Any questions, comments, stories about your backyard? Gary, are you looking to? There are a couple more questions in the chat, too. Oh, why am I? <clears throat> oh, are deer harvested to eat is one question. Charles or Jordan? <clears throat> Jordan, you want to take that yeah. one? Yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, deer are harvested to eat. Um, that's one slide that I left out from a different presentation. So some of these urban control uh, uh, programs, all pretty much all of the deer are uh, donated to organizations like Hunters for the Hungry uh, to, to, to provide food to those that are less fortunate. And um, I'm looking in the chat box and I see someone, uh, Lu Lucia Anderson asks, are other animals affected by this wasting disease? Yes, um, chronic wasting disease in the same family as scrapie and sheep and mad cow disease in, in cattle. Um, it affects other cervids or other deer-like animals. So currently, um, we don't know if the if deer if CWD can make the jump to humans just yet. You know, it's been on the landscape for a long time, but these are uh, things that can take a long time to show up. Um, so right now, it's kind of a big question mark as far as the CDC is concerned. Um, we really highly recommend any deer that's taken to be tested for C CWD, and if it's tested and it, the result is positive, the recommendation is to not eat that meat um, until uh, we can get further information on it. 
Okay, and Kate, you had a do you have something to add, Charles? Uh, no, I was looking at some of the other comments on the chat, but I'll wait and hear what you're saying. Oh, no, I was just going to say, Kate, do you want to just ask your question now? It was basically just answered. It was about the wasting disease and could it affect humans? And then did you also ask about sharpshooter programs? Oh, I just wondered what the sharpshooter programs meant. Is that somebody other than just local hunters or is that somebody who's hired to um, hunt the deer? Yeah, so sharpshooting has been implemented across the region uh, for decades, and mo it's been employed at two different primary levels. It's been employed uh, by lo localities, so it's been both in Virginia and Maryland, local governments have implemented sharpshooting to lower deer, deer herds in, at very specific locations, usually in parks. And the federal level, the, uh, the federal government, and right now it's going on Manassas Battlefield within Prince William County, is using sharpshooting specifically because they don't want hunters on the, on the parklands. So they use uh, sharpshooters. It's much more expensive. It costs anywhere from $150 to $200 per deer to sharpshoot as where hunting is much less expensive. So sharpshooting is not a viable option from a cost effective perspective, but it can be very effective within a certain land area if you have a good program. And usually they're structured uh, like Rock Creek Park has a great um, write up for how they're doing it in DC. There's a report on the six uh, national parks that are under the management plan that's including Manassas Battlefield. And as I mentioned earlier, Brian Garcia, who's the natural resource manager of Manassas Battlefield, has indicated that with three years of sharpshooting, he's beginning to see um, a lot of tree seedlings in the understory and their spotlight counts, which are actual uh, methodical counts of the deer are indicating lower numbers. So it seems to be a trend, at least, in Manassas Battlefield. So sharpshooting is employed. It's not effective though, over large areas. It, again, it's very expensive. And what tends to be the case is the most af affordable and accessible programs are the ones where you use private hunters, whether through shotgun where it's available and or archery, which is, is pretty much universally applicable, even in urban parks. Eileen, you have a long question and a story. Do you want to share now? Um, sure. Thank you so much. A great presentation. Um, I, I, I do I, um, have a question with communities, old communities like ours that have um, have places that have land being cut down, clear cut. And um, we have a situation with 300 some acres here of old growth uh, forest that were cut down and all of a sudden we're seeing all of these deer like just lit, hanging out in the neighborhood, dead on the road. Um, what resources or what recourses do we have if we find out that like true, the landowner has the right to do whatever they want with their, with their land, but that was old growth. And at the same time, there were, you know, we need to think about a balance with the animals too, with the wildlife too. Like, like now what happens because we're left to have to deal with it. He cut, the, he cut the land, he cut the trees. And now what do we do? Because we have to deal with it now. Well, I, I would do two things. I would separate the issues. Um, I fully understand the impacts of clearing forested areas and land development. That's a local development issue. It's all regulated at the lo local level. Um, the, the owner generally has the right to do whatever the land is zoned for, um, th th but it is very important. And, and Kim would be the best person to tell us about efforts to try to influence land use decisions. I will say this, though. Realistically, forest does not support that many deer. Uh, in purely forested stands, uh, the deer quickly eat out the forage. There's far more deer on the edge edges of those forests and in suburban areas uh, and altered landscapes. So you may be seeing more deer. Certainly there might be a few displaced by the clearing, but the likelihood is deer numbers are just increasing in your area and they thrive in your yard. They're in suburbia in huge numbers and that, mos that landscape mosaic is ideal deer habitat. So I think Separating the two issues is important. Looking at that land use development impact issue, 
but the deer numbers are going to keep going up regardless and they are much higher densities just like raccoons there's many more raccoons in your backyard than there are in a forest because there's human derived food resources for deer it's an altered landscape that offers a lot more food around people so i think people and deer go hand in hand they really do and it's that uh, decision to try to manage that deer population to lower those numbers so that we can recover the native plants which feed everything else and that's really the kind of the focus from my perspective yeah i will um back support that just by saying as i wear many hats as a district biologist and one of the hats that i wear is a private lands biologist because uh, until recently we didn't have that position available for the last couple of years and so part of my job is going out and, and working with landowners to try and assess how they might enhance a habitat for deer and charles is right an old growth forest that's not, not been disturbed for a long time is really not a place where deer are going to spend a lot of time um, so for people who want to increase habitat value for deer, we usually do recommend some kind of, um, you know, minimal disturbance, not a full on clear cut necessarily, depending on the situation, but really opening up the understory to help, like like Charles said in his presentation, they're really uh, thriving off of those broadleaf forbs that grow low to the ground. And then what the other thing that you have happening is that forests that are old growth that have been there for a while, uh, the, the plants on the ground have already been devoured and just completely destroyed. And so now if you have a natural event, say a tree falls in the forest and now you have an open area where sunlight can open up and start reaching the ground again and start, uh, some of those forbs can start to grow back. Uh, you really are losing that, that, that biodiversity because those plants don't get the chance to, to grow. As soon as they start to grow up, the deer come in and annihilate it. And so the idea that, um, you know, someone's uh, cutting down an entire forest and that is pushing deer out of one area, it's similar to where my expertise really lies is in, is in bears. And I get the same, uh, the same questions when it comes to bears. Hey, all this development's causing these bears to come into our, our backyards. Not necessarily the case. Um, really, sometimes what we have in our backyards is more attractive than what's in those forests and, and as the development increases it just increases uh the the likelihood of of having good forage content for those animals whether it be our, our bird feeders for bears or our azaleas and and the plants that we that we spend money on um and bring those deer toward towards us it's true um Sarah, thank you thank you thank you thank you Sarah, do you have a question about prions? Was the same question as, as to whether the chronic wasting disease could affect humans. So it's been answered. Okay. And you got Lucia, right, Charles? About explosive residential development? Yeah, I see that. I'm um, sure it's seeing foxes. So again, foxes and skunks and possums, I mentioned before with the Bambi slide, they are highly adaptive and um, they actually, their numbers often increase around suburban development. Now when it gets truly urban, if you're in Tyson's Corner, you'll have far fewer organisms, except for rats and things like that, which are non-native species, which are human dependent. But when you're thinking about foxes, skunks, and deer, they are truly human um, habitat, human altered habitats are favorable for their numbers. Um, and so I think the key again is, is that it's not necessarily true that seeing more of them is, is an indication that land disturbance is pushing them into your area. It's more likely that the altered landscape you live in is favorable and their numbers are increasing. What you would likely not see are warblers, are uh, more salamanders, are you know a lot of insects. Those are the those are the organisms, the unsung heroes that are truly being eliminated, the non-adaptive species that require an abundance of native plants to survive. And that's the part that's the saddest. I showed you some of the slides of, of native plants that were in my old neighborhood near Manassas that was forested. And that was a low density area of everybody's on well and septic. So there were still some cool old woods in that area, 
Um, but where the deer were browsing, the plants were really eliminated. So I, I, I think I, I would again divide up the two concepts. It's really putting native flora back in the landscape. And it, it is truly, it is, you are correct in the sense of land development for preserving natural resources wherever we can because we don't get back good stands of forest or mature vegetation. Um, but it, but I would separate the two issues out. It seems to me that education, um, this today has been so eye-opening for me because I've, I've always been a person who didn't like hunting, who thought the deer were so beautiful and wonderful and part of our environment. And now I'm seeing that, whoa, they are really having a negative impact in a lot of ways on our plants and on our birds and on our insects. And I, that's been really eye-opening for me. And now I see the reasoning behind needing to control the deer where I really wasn't seeing that before, except for hitting deer in the road. Yeah, and actually, um... Jordan and Charles, you didn't really mention the problems with drivers. I know I was with my son and a deer ran right into the side of the car. It was downright alarming. You too, Lucia. Which I think the numbers for that are pretty high in Prince William and the state. Took the driver's side mirror, rear view mirror off right away. <laughs> oh yeah, gone. Uh, can I um, ask my question about recommendations for plants that repel deer? I mean, if we're planting all the wrong sort of things like azaleas that attract deer, um, what yeah. do we, I know, Kim, you're going to say native species. Well, I was uh, actually going to say, we've been, um, I heard someplace about a fertilizer called malorganite, malorganite, which I think is made from a human waste pro product. And we have been using it at Merrimack Farm. Um, with good success for a few Melich. years. How does it spell? M-E-L-O-R-G-A-N-I-T-E. Okay. Have you heard so, Charles? I have not, but you know, I, there's a lots of things, and, and Jordan mentioned the fact that you should not create your own uh, things that repel deer. There are some scent-oriented things, though. People for years have used things like um, blood meal uh there that is like it has a has a apparently it's just the smell of it repels deer they've put like their sweaty t-shirt on the fence or they've used uh irish spring soap on you know hung, hung up in different places and again there might be some limited uh applicability your question is really good though because i i I'd refer to a few things the plant nova natives campaign which um is uh really active throughout northern virginia when when the guide was rewritten, you can look up the guide for free online. Uh, just look up plantnovanatives.org. And in the guide, there are uh, recommendations for deer-resistant plants. And it's a really good place to, to look that up. I think Kim's mention of the Merrimack Garden is really important because they're gardening in a very deer-heavy landscape. So I tie back to Kim and Ashley and the folks that are gardening there at Merrimack for some good suggestions mm -hmm. as to what to do. There's a whole crew through the Master Gardeners uh, of Prince William County that also are worked with landowners and they offer often free site visits to give them advice to the Master Gardeners on plants they might employ. And they're increasingly networked with Audubon and so they've got a great network. Matter of fact, Leslie, who leads the Audubon Home Ambassadors for Prince William County, she is also a master gardener. And so there's a, some really good resources out there that you might link up with uh, who can offer some great advice on less deer friendly plants and more deer resistant plants that are native and provide a lot of the good habitat benefits. Can you give me that um, website again, the plant something natives? So Plant Nova Natives. Plant Nova Natives. And Plant we Nova send, Natives. we'll send out a follow-up email and we can put the link right to it in that. Yeah, so, and then of course, Kim and, and all the volunteers at Merrimack, also the uh, Prince William Master Gardeners and, and the uh, Audubon at Home program. The Audubon at Home program has an ambassador program that's active in Prince William County. And they have volunteers who may come to your yard if you're interested in becoming Audubon certified, who could offer you advice on what to plant. As I said, they overlap very closely with the Master Gardener program. Thank you. Thank you. 
on the Plant Nova Natives website is very helpful. But the Melorganite that we've been using, Charles, is a scent-oriented repellent. And yeah. so far, we haven't lost anything. So I don't care if it's my imagination. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, and it certainly could potentially have an influence. Just that huh. I would be careful to trust too long in anything that's scent-oriented. Um, because deer tend to become adapted to things just like geese do and right. other wildlife that are adaptive. They often overcome the things we think are pushing them away uh, over time. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't rely too long on one, one way of doing it. I can do a little experiment. <laughs> no stories of backyards. Hey, Helen, nice to see you. Okay, I'm trying to think of a quite, you know, something I would like to know too, so I don't think of it as soon as we all get off the phone or off the program. And did we lose? Oh, Charles is there. So, Jordan, I would act, actually, do you know anything about hunting at Merrimack Farm, like how successful it's been in the past year or so? Um, yeah, so Merrimack farm hunting is uh, based on a quota system. Uh, it's uh, uh, you have to put your name in a hat and you get selected and we have we have certain days and it depends on uh, what species you're looking for. Um, it's a, a, a general season or 303 season I think is a multi species season. You can get anything there but except for waterfowl and quail I believe. Um, and uh, there's, there, it's uh, not always a, a lot of animals taken, but it's definitely successful. There are deer there for sure. There are turkey there for sure. Um, that's a, the turkey hunt is a different um, quota hunt, but yeah. So uh, as far as the, the hunting side of it that I'm involved with, uh, just managing it as, as for those that want to hunt on there, it's a very successful program. Now, as far as the ecological impact and um, ability, you know, to, to really produce a lot of good on Merrimack, that'd probably be the, the, one of the wildlife management area folks like Joe Ferdinandson would probably have a better grasp on that than I do. Well, I, I do notice walking around that the, the woods in the surrounding areas seem to be, have a lot of undergrowth. Yeah, and unfortunately, I just don't get a chance to make it out there that often, uh, covering six counties and the 2.5 million people that are under my, my mm -hmm. care. <laughs> and all calling you up with questions, huh? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, I was going to add in so a couple quick uh, <laughs> thoughts that, you know, in Prince William, there's some wonderful existing programs. The thing to remember is, is for years, there's been hunting going on at Leeselvania State Park at Quantico Marine Corps Base, um, more recently at Conway Robinson, but that program is pretty old now. That's been going on now for at least 10 years. There uh, at, at Aquan Bay National Wildlife Refuge, there's been a hunting program. There's also the Manassas Battlefield, the Sharpshoot program. So on public lands on the state and federal properties, there's been deer management going on for years. Also, there's very successful programs like Lake Ridge Community um, where you know, the community took it into their own hands to manage their 120 acres or so of, of community land to invite hunters in. And they actually modeled it after the Fairfax County Archery Program, where several members there had hunted in that program. And they're effectively implementing deer management on private property. And I know Kim helped lead the, the education process from when that program went into place. And it's been very effective. And I think what it's shown is, is that on common lands and public lands, you can safely and effectively implement a hunting program, which is low cost or no cost to the, to the public and can, can contribute to helping to control deer populations so that you can recover plants and have the other wildlife that are hugely beneficial and rely on those plants. So I think, you know, Prince William, uh, Kim's, I think the, the push up front was to this program at least 
the push to restore it to the, the program on Prince William County Parkland. But I would also encourage you to um, expand it on other private lands within the county. Oh, and I forgot to mention the fact that Merrimack, is, as Jordan and Kim were saying, has also been hunted down for quite a few years. So just really the promotion of the, of the process for holistic landscape scale management. Well, Merrimack has actually been hunted for many, many years. It was before it was saved and protected as a wildlife management area. It was a hunting preserve. So a lot of, but I would encourage you to um, share your views with the Board of Supervisors about hunting, which you can easily do by just sending an email to bocs at pwcgov.org. And we'll put that in our follow-up email also. I think it's good for the deer. It's good for all the other wildlife and just a positive always around. No one here wakes up every morning to hordes of deer in their yards. There is a question in the chat from Sarah that talks about oh. what can be done in the managed deer in urban areas, mostly small yards. And I think the key is, and this is what we kind of worked on this in Fairfax, and I did it, I hunted my own yard. I had one acre near Manassas, and we were on well and septic, so the, lot, the lots were bigger, but I used a crossbow. And uh, the key is um, that you are very cognizant of your neighbors and that you um, take the deer, take very, you know, you're proficient with your, your chosen um, implement, whether, you know, it's usually a bow, but, um, and taking safe shots. But the other thing is the permission from your neighbors to track and retrieve. So the key would be, I, I hear what you're saying on very small lots would be difficult to do. I think you have to look at the larger landscape scale. If there's community association land or, or local park land, really lobby whoever has authority to allow safe hunting. And, and, and then recruiting hunters can be difficult. It's best, I think the Lake Ridge model is wonderful because Lake Ridge decided to recruit within their own community. So the Lake Ridge hunters live in Lake Ridge and it's beautiful because they live there. It's not somebody else coming in to do it. It is the people that live there doing it and they have a great program. So if you have a community association, um, not just to push them out there, but I think if you wanna reach out to the Lake Ridge hunting program, they're a great model to, to build off of. Um, but I would just say trying to get access to lots that are large enough to put hunters on and making sure they have track and retrieve permission from the surrounding property owners. So if the deer crosses the property line, they have the permission from that owner to track and retrieve the deer, which they're obligated to do under state game law is to track and retrieve and, and not waste the meat. So uh, it really is that effort to try to hunt where you can. And again, you don't have to hunt everywhere, but you have to apply pressure across a larger land area. So the more places we can get pressure on the herd, the more uh, systemic kind of pressure we can put on the population and then begin to recover plants across the landscape. And if you couple that with efforts to um, put some fencing in around some plants, plant more resistant uh, things, modify behavior with your dogs urinating as many places as they can and barking at the deer <laughs> at odd hours uh, and, and changing their habits, you know, uh, all those things uh, can really help. And, you know, so I think that it's that, it's that diverse approach. Yeah, I believe Heritage Hunt also has a successful program. They do. That's right. I couldn't remember the name of it. Heritage Hunt, I believe, is off Route 15. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure they'd be glad to talk to people about um, setting up another, pro you know, an HOA hunting program, as I know Lake Ridge would. Jordan, you have any thoughts? Um, just uh, in, in closing, really, it's just for for all of the wildlife uh, things that I, I have to deal with, um, it, it it's really not something I can do alone, clearly. It's not something our agency can do alone. And so we really do re rely on partnerships with people. Everyone plays a role. And I think a big part of that is just kind of self-determining um, how much of a role everyone wants to pl play. Um, 
when I deal with bears, it's, it's, a, it's a public safety issue in some cases. So really, you know, we don't have the option in some places, but really as far as an ecological health of the system, uh, we really uh, try to do my best. And I really um, am grateful for the opportunity to be here to help participate with this organization and getting education out there because there's just not, I don't have a megaphone big enough and people necessarily always willing to listen. And, and so I definitely appreciate each and every one of you for taking the time uh, to, to be a part of this presentation and listen to what, what we've had to cover. Yeah, and I see here in the chat that somebody has got deer eating their spice bush. So I guess they like a little flavor in their leaves sometimes. And a question, just last one, in somebody who lives in Alexandria City, and I think is wondering, could they actually have a herd in our, their nearby stream park? Which I would guess the answer is yes. They certainly could. I mean, there's uh, there are deer everywhere. So uh, there's... It's never surprising how urban the site is. Like I said, Tyson's Corner has deer. Now, not where you know the Galleria is. Well, actually, near the Galleria there are some deer, but but uh, not where the tallest buildings are. But in all of the nooks and crannies where they can subsist, they do. And matter of fact, in Tyson's, I've been in there recently a number of times in the the uh, Vienna side of the stream quarters near Tyson's. And the deer walk down the middle of the road in the in the subdivision in the middle of the day, and they're just part of the the landscape. So uh, they're everywhere, and and I guess the issue of trying to manage them in more urban areas, it, it will take more effort to do so. In the more urban the area is, to make sure people are comfortable with the effort. But again, wherever we can plot or apply the effort, we should, uh, in my opinion. Thank you so much. And thank, every, thank you to everyone who came and um, I hope you enjoyed the program. I hope it helps us move on in our quest to manage deer for their betterment and ours and all the wildlife that lives in our backyards. <laughs>